Good evening, everyone. This is Ryan Hoyme, a.k.a. Massage Nerd, and tonight we have a special blue guest tonight. So, <laughs> And her name is Alyssa. She's a massage therapist with a small practice in Massachusetts. Um, her website, White, uh, Writing a Blue Streak, just celebrated its first year anniversary of bringing business and marketing resources to the massage therapists all over the world. Welcome tonight. Hi, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I like the way you pronounce Massachusetts with your little Minnesota accent. Yeah, you can tell. <laughs> That'd be nasty. Yeah. You would last about five minutes in New England. Yeah. <laughs> like, we would have you mugged and we would beat the R's out of you in about 10 seconds. <laughs> this is Alyssa and Ryan show tonight. <laughs> you <laughs> so what what got you all involved in blue hair um it's uh it was just a an i it was a thing my grandmother used to say um she used to say oh she would talk a blue streak and um i was having my early midlife crisis about a year and a half ago and i'm far too young to be buying like ridiculous sports cars so i thought i would do something insane with my hair and um it was an odd phone call with Greg Hurd, my best friend, and I threw this out at him, and I said, I had been thinking about doing the blog, and I said, hey, what do you think if I dye half my hair blue, and I don't know if you can see it in this light, you can kind of see it, um, and then name my blog Writing a Blue Streak, and he said, I don't see why you would not do that, and so I did it, and now I have to keep this hair blue until everybody recognizes me, <laughs> and then I can go back to my normal hair. <laughs> and it's great too because I, I, after I did it, um, it's you know I really struggle in big social groups. So for me to just go and introduce myself to people, that's not going to happen. So the blue hair helps because people immediately recognize me and they they introduce themselves to me, and that works really well. <laughs> but the thing is, everybody knows you now, so that's the nice thing about it because you know, it's your trademark. I'm gonna another year and uh, maybe a little less than that, and uh, and then just I'm kind of hoping my grandmother and my aunt both went totally gray all at once, and I think that would be really cool. Like I'd love to just have white gray hair, so I'm kind of hoping that happens soon, so I can just go with that and not have to worry about the blue. <laughs> <laughs> I'm playing. Yeah. Okay, so tonight's um, topic is going to be personality, professionalism, and promotion, and how to run a successful business and hug wind, wind chimes at the same time. So, <laughs> is that possible? It really is possible. Um, and I, I talk a lot about the personality in your marketing, um, because we have such an odd gray area that massage therapists and any kind of body workers stick in. We kind of maintain this weird level of professionalism that's required by healthcare professionals. And we try to be a warm and personable provider of touch. And it's a very, it's a very scary place to be, um, you know, dealing with permeable boundaries and firm boundaries. And uh, it's something, it's, it's just something that we all struggle with every single day, but it is possible. And, um, I kind of wanted to talk about the two biggest issues that we deal with. Can I do that? Oh, we loved it. <laughs> okay, I'm going to go with it. I'm not even going to wait for you to ask the question. Um, I have been talking to a lot of people in the past couple of weeks about what we wanted to focus on during this call. And the number one uh, topic that people came up with is how do you know when to give your work away for free? Because I think in general, if you're in this field, you want to give and you like people and you know massage can help them and you want everybody to experience this. And I think it's something like 60% of the population hasn't even experienced massage. So we tend to say, oh, I'll give you a massage. And people are like, ah, oh, it's $70 an hour. And I think we kind of get sucked into giving our work away for free, especially with share massage. And this is the big thing. And I'm going to tell you a little story. A friend of mine works at a massage school, and um, a car dealership called up and said, we would love to have massage at our um, customer appreciation day. There were going to be this big outside fair with tents and the whole bit, and they were having a couple of local professionals from um, some different local businesses come in and, 
think it was going to be a restaurant doing little samples of food. And they said, can you send us um, some interns to do chair massage? And he said, well, I certainly can, but they need to have a supervisor. It's our state law. And the supervisor would need to be paid. And they said, well, we, we really want something for free. And he said, well, that's not going to happen with interns through us. And he sent an email out to a couple of alumni. And um, all of us thought, yeah, I'm not going to go sit in the hot sun for four hours at a customer appreciation <laughs> car dealership event and do chair massage and not get paid. And they said, well, it's, you know, you'll get clients from around here. And, yeah, that's working for free for your customer appreciation event. And that's not okay. So, and this happens, I think, with chair massage more than anything else. Um, so we talked a lot, uh, some different friends and I over the past couple of weeks about what are the rough guidelines for giving work away. So we came up with a few that I'm going to share with you. Um, <laughs> if there's, <laughs> and then we'll have lots of time for questions. Yeah. Um, I think like that. I didn't even make a joke yet. And you're laughing. <laughs> it's, I'm, I'm just laughing at the hair. No. <laughs> Snap. You're jealous because you don't have any. I can wear wigs though and change them anytime I want. <laughs> so when we're doing chair massage and when we're asked to do chair massage, um, here are some ways we can weigh it. Um, if this is a, a job, like a real event, we're not going to talk charity events yet. Um, if I need clients, if I'm not busy enough at my office and I need clients, um, and this, uh, whatever this job is, there will be not just potential clients, but potential ideal clients, the kind of people I'm looking for, are going to be at whatever type of event this is. I do it, but I do it for a dollar a minute. Sometimes I'll do it for a little less than that. Sometimes I'll do it for 15 minutes for 10 bucks. Um, and I keep it at a nice, mellow, leisurely pace so I'm not working too hard, and so that I get to chat with people and talk to them so that when they ask me, you know, oh, what kind of work do you do, or what's your, your office like, I get a chance to talk to them. I always get permission to get an email, to put out an email sign-up list. And often I'll raffle off um, a few half-hour gift certificates for people who enter my list, um, you know, put their emails on there. Um, and another idea that I heard from somebody was to have a little, uh, your business card or a postcard, so that if someone spends $10 on your chair massage today, they get 10 bucks off their first office visit. Because we're looking for ways, if you're gonna spend, if you're gonna take the time to schlep your chair and go to some event and leave your office and give up time at your office, um, you really wanna make sure that you're doing your best to convert these chair massage clients to your office, if that's your goal. Some people do chair massage and get paid very well for it hourly, but we're just talking about when people want you to do chair massage and they ask you, and then they don't want you to do it for a cut rate. But if you can, if the job is gonna involve your potential clients being there, ideal clients being there, um, and you can make it work for you without losing money, then that's a really good way to do it if you can convert that into clients getting to your office. If it's a charity event, different rules can apply. Um, again, potential ideal clients will be there. Uh, recently there was a Relay for Life event in my town, and it's very close to me. And that would be a great venue to do some chair massage. And if it's uh, for a charity event, and it's a charity that's close to your heart, it doesn't mean you say yes to everybody who calls you. Um, I a lot of times do it for free. Or I'll put out some kind of a tip jar with a suggested donation, and then I'll donate that money back to the event, which is sweet because then you can take in cash, and then you can write a check for that, and then you can write that off. You can take that to debt commission. Oh. Um, like, yeah, see, there you go. I mean, you can always just hand the bucket of cash to them too. Um, but I like the suggested donation at a charity event because then people can, whatever, they may have already shelled out a lot of bucks for this event, like a Relay for Life or something. Nonetheless, um, I like to put something out there because I like for there to be a value to the massage. I like for people to realize that the service, my service and my skill is in exchange for money. It's skill. We trained for it. We pay for tuition. And this feeds us in rent. So it is. Um, I like to make sure there's always some kind of exchange, even if it's just a charity event and it's a suggested donation. And even if that's going back to the charity, I like to have that there. I think it sets up a level of respect for your work than just having a sign that says free massage. 
I think that devalues and undermines all of us when that happens most of the time. There's always exceptions to these things. Um, and again, if you can get uh, people added to your email list that way, again, if you could do a raffle for a half hour gift certificate, likely someone will upgrade to an hour and pay the difference, so at least you're covering your costs. Um, I think these are really great things. And if you're vigilant about following up email to everybody um, who got on your list and doing a follow-up email that welcomes them to your office and gives a link to your website, says hello, and thanks them for seeing you at that event, that's an excellent way to convert. I think the hardest part for us is saying no. And when someone wants you to do just free work, I think it's important to say no. And of course there are exceptions, but um, that's a big deal. And I think that that's hard for us because as caretakers and health professionals and wellness providers, we want to help. And we are I think in general, the audience listening to this, if we're body workers, you're probably a very kind and generous person. You want people to receive the service that you have because you know how wonderful and life-changing it can be. But nobody's going to buy the cow if they're getting that milk for free. So if you're showing up, you're not charging for every single... Um, if you're not charging and you're out there in the public giving away free massage, people are going to think they're going to your office and it should be free there too. Yeah, because I, th I think schools um, are somewhat to blame to that, too, because, again, we're so used, we want the students to get um, that experience as much as possible, and, of course, the easiest way to do that is chair massage and offering it free, and plus they get that experience communicating with the public, but, yeah, there's a really fine line, I would definitely say, with that. It's hard, and, you know, there, in every every field, in healthcare and every there are interns, and interns traditionally will work for free or very little, and it, it's that transition, and it's, I think a lot of times interns in massage schools are, are the ones out there in the public eye the most, and and that appropriately so, but um, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult line to walk, and uh, you know, when do you give your work away, and how much do you need that money? We, we're, we need to support ourselves here. And, uh, you know, you shouldn't be going into companies and doing free massage just because it could bring back somebody back to your office. You need, I, I really strongly feel there needs to be some exchange, some kind of exchange. And do you see massage therapists in general being too nice, too? I think that, in my experience, massage therapists, more than most health and wellness providers, have trouble with those boundaries, have trouble with saying no. I mean, you're going to find that in any walk of life. There are just people who can't say no. I think there are people, there are massage therapists who need more uh, help from mentors and help from other therapists, um, emotional therapists, not just massage therapists. Um, I think there's certainly a subset of this population of massage therapists who really like being, uh, I don't want to say healers, but they... It, it's, it's about being codependent on your work. If you're getting all of your self-worth from clients coming in the door and saying, you healed me, then you're codependent on your work. So it's, it's hard, I think, for some practitioners to say no because we get our self-worth from that. And it's appropriate to get a certain amount from that. And there's a reason I don't teach ethics and boundaries, so this is all very much my experience coming out. Um, and you should all take an ethics class to study boundaries more carefully than I can tell you now. <laughs> um, but yes, I think massage therapists, more than most providers, because we tend to be warm, kind people who touch other people, it's especially an issue for us. Yeah, and I've, I've noticed a lot, too, with boundaries, too. I mean, uh, for being friends and stuff with clients, have you heard about that a lot, too? Or uh, well, how, do you com how do you combat that? Or we could talk for hours about doing relationships. <laughs> and that, again, is not my specialty. <laughs> um, I can talk about where the boundaries are in your personality and marketing. Um, you know, it's, I you know, did the webinar a couple of weeks ago about um, being yourself in your marketing um, that will give you a much more genuine feel, appropriately, and I will draw people to you and I think cause most people's businesses to be more successful if you can be yourself, but there are boundaries you don't cross. Um, and I'm not an ethics teacher who can talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 
I'm not even gonna pretend. I'm gonna get my like my old ethics teacher's gonna call me tomorrow and say, You put your foot in your mouth and I'm gonna have to write an apology post. I'm not doing it. <laughs> and what kind of topics do you usually go over um in on your blog? Is there any um core area that you go over or I um I you know, it's massage and business and I touch on ethics, um, but only from a very um experiential this is my this is my life in a small practice where I see about 20 patients a week and um, I'll probably get a phone call tomorrow because I call them patients instead of clients I used to work in a chiropractor's office and I struggle with that um, but I write you know a lot about a lot about online marketing which is not what I thought I would be writing about when I started this um, I guess it was a natural evolution but um, about the business of massage shoe, and um, I haven't touched a lot on record keeping, but a little bit about that and business practices. And um, I didn't think I would talk as much about marketing as I do. Um, but there it is. It, I kind of found myself in it, and I'm really, really loving it. So it's it's really mostly marketing with a little business stuff, practices, daily life, and a small practice thrown in. And what are um, some good marketing things for online then I mean Facebook everybody knows but are there any other options or people that are, that are up and coming I really think um, that email marketing is king and you read posts every other day that say email marketing is dead and um, you know to the, uh, there's even stuff this is Facebook is already over I think wherever your audience is that's where you need to be. You know, my clients, the bulk of them are not on Twitter yet. Um, I got five or six people in my core of about, I'd say about 200 clients. Um, I got five who are on Twitter. I still have a Twitter from my practice and I use it. I, because I think that ultimately more and more people will be. And I'm also seeing younger and younger clients. So I think the handful of my clients who are just out of college, um, they're getting more hit with that. I haven't found a lot of clients uh, doing a lot of LinkedIn stuff yet, but I think that's just my particular group of clients. And also, my um, LinkedIn bores me. It bores me. I haven't spent that time on it. I really need to. Michael Reynolds and I talk about this all the time because he's all over LinkedIn and I'm not. And I've written one recommendation. It's just, it's like Facebook without the fun for me. Um, and so it's something I'm forcing myself to do more because I know it will be important as more of my clients, many of them local business owners, um, get hit with that. I don't know what's next after Facebook. If I knew that, I wouldn't need to be talking to you. I would, I'd have my money invested there and I'd be off retiring early as soon as that came around. But um, right now, ask your clients. For me, I think email marketing is king. Facebook is second. I think Twitter's going to come right up there. Um, but Twitter, I think, is underutilized for massage therapists in that it's a great vehicle for us to communicate with each other and with some bigger marketers. And I learn so much every day just from my Twitter dream. And it's all from uh, massage therapists, colleagues, and massage schools, and a couple marketers in there. Um, it's underutilized, and, uh, and that, that makes me sad because it's way, I think Twitter's way more fun than Facebook. <laughs> it but, uh, really is. You know, it really is. Some some English majors I've talked to, they said it's actually insulting because it's 140 characters or less, and English majors want to talk, 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 and <laughs> or type, oh, type, type. yeah, they want to write complex <laughs> and compound sentences, yeah. and here's your fourth, 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 they all think they're attorneys. No, I think... Um, Twitter forces you to be concise. It forces you to figure out what you're trying to say and say it as quickly and clearly as possible. And that is way harder. It is way harder to get an important point across in 140 characters clearly to your audience than it is you know, to write some 2,000-word blog post like me where I blather on and on and on and on and link to 27 different posts. Um, Twitter is harder. In that respect, and it's way more fun, and uh, it's fast, and it, I learn more from that seriously every day than from any other venue. Have you ever tried Buzz at all, the Google? I haven't, but mostly um, because when that came around, I still had a yucky old computer, and it couldn't handle anything. And by the time I got the Mac, I was it was kind of gone for me. It was oh, you're, off my you're, you're a Mac lover too. 
I am. Oh. <laughs> Wait, I said, somebody, I don't remember who it was. Oh, Chris told me I needed to try to work this in. I got the new, my old iPhone finally died after two years. And she said I had to find a new, a way to get this one in the um, webcast. Um, this is a blue case that matches my hair. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> And then Angela Palmer says um, she gives um, great fa um, fashion advice. Um, yeah, she does. <laughs> <laughs> and YF Choi says and sometimes talks about food. Oh, I talk about food all the time. And I do talk about fashion. Um, <laughs> uh, I do. Not so much fashion as appropriateness. If you're going into work in a tight T-shirt with something printed on the front and scrub pants and flip-flops, how can you possibly be expected, how can you expect that you're going to be taken seriously by your clients? Like, seriously, you can't even get away with working at Old Navy dress like that. And yet I see it all the time. Massage therapists are dressing like, I don't know, and some people love scrubs and that's totally cool, but they're way them look professional the way them look sloppy. And, but wearing anything sloppy or wearing a t-shirt or wearing something low cut, I have seen in a massage magazine an article about dress code and the author's headshot had her in a strapless top. Seriously? Seriously. You're writing to, to me about ethics and dress code and bring up the neckline, lady. <laughs> totally, like, completely inappropriate. If you're uh, Gloria Coppola, and you're teaching a Lomi Lomi class in an appropriately tied sarong, two points for you. If you're writing about ethics and professionalism and you're wearing a strapless shirt, not okay. And the same types of things go for men. Male massage therapists tend to dress. No, I shouldn't say that. They don't. I, I, I don't want to say that. I have seen enough male massage therapists who dress very sloppily that it, it gives me pause. And so I don't want, um, I always, when I do some kind of a dress code thing, I always get like three or four emails saying that I'm super biased towards women and I'm very judgmental and we, we should not be judged on what we wear. If you expect to be considered a health professional, any kind of wellness provider, or a business person, or a competent employee, so no matter where you are in this field, if you expect to be taken seriously, you can't be wearing faded out yoga pants and a t-shirt with a, a deep V that shows everything off when you bend over to do an up Like this is not, this is not acceptable. So I do talk not so much about fashion. I joke about fashion, but I'm serious about dress code and professionalism. And yeah, I usually am talking about what I'm eating because I'm usually snacking. <laughs> and then you actually called me out at the AMTA National Convention. Oh crap. Yeah. <laughs> Is it for the Crocs? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> okay, Crocs aren't shoes. They're not shoes. They're they're pieces of plastic that are like duck feet on your feet. They're they're not they're not shoes. And maybe they're very comfortable. And if that's the case, awesome. You should, everybody should wear them in their office or at their workplace. Or I know you teach, so you're on your feet all day. But man, not at the convention. You're killing me. <laughs> <laughs> it was at the Facebook meet and greet. Come on. <laughs> You had them on in the exhibit hall with shirts and socks. Maybe, yeah. <laughs> you did, you did. I'm going to let you get away with that because you're from Minnesota, but you come up here. It's all over for you, though. Yeah. <laughs> and what's this? Um, what if you're starting your practice and you have nothing better to do? <laughs> I see 20 um, some clients a week. Really busy. I'm actually. They accepting new clients who are referrals from current clients, and uh, I really pick and choose many clients. So I'm plenty busy, but I don't. I choose to not do more than that because I, I get kind of cranky after about 23 clients in a week. I get a little cranky. I'm not the best massage therapist that I can be, so I I cut it off at about 20. And and the rest of the time, you know, I don't have any hobbies. This is what I do, and uh, I'm not very good at sports, and I can't knit. Knitting drives me crazy. So. Yeah, I'm pretty much doing this. <laughs> <laughs> so I know you're a big, huge um, stickler with Facebook and keeping your um, your profile basically private for your own friends and then your fan page separate, right? Well, not so much. Um, right now, I'm 
Right now, my pet peeve, my biggest pet peeve, is people who are using, I know, I have a lot of them. Um, that's why you love me. That's why you're listening. Um, the, uh, you know, a Facebook profile, I have one, and it should say Alyssa Haynes. Profiles are for people. What's driving me crazy right now are people who are using profiles with their business names. Profiles for people. Pages are for businesses. And it's not just me being silly and, you know, being judgmental. It's about Facebook's terms of service. You, when you sign up for Facebook, you are agreeing to their, their terms of service. And I don't want to hear people who are like, Facebook changed everything and they don't have the right to dictate it. Yeah, they do. It's free and you opt in. They can do whatever they want. Suck it up. If you want a, a network where you have those kinds of choices, then go find a network you can pay to be part of. Nonetheless, um... Yeah, it drives me crazy, and I, a couple of times a week, I'll get a friend request from a business, and it's a business name. I don't know who this person is. I don't know if I know them. I got one after a convention, and, you know, I got this friend request, and there was no message along with it, so mm, minus one. Um, so I sent a message back. I found their profile, and I sent a message back, and I said, I'm sorry, do I know you? Because your profile is inappropriately used as a business. And I don't know if we've met or if this is just kind of a random request or what. And he was very nice. And he sent a message back and he gave me his name and he said, we actually did meet. And I said, if you create a fan page for your business, I will be the first person to be a fan and I actually really like your product. So I'll probably share that with people. However, you're a profile. And that here's the downside. When you create a fan page for your business, that's an open venue. So anybody can go to that fan page and look at that stream and see it. When you're a profile, everybody can't see necessarily what you're posting. So you're closing your business off. So instead of having a billboard, like a fan page is a billboard for your business online, when you do a profile, you're making it a greeting card that only people you give it to, people you friend can see. And that's just silly. It's just an unwise business move, and it violates Facebook in terms of service. So that's my thing about that. Um, profiles are for people. Pages are for businesses. And you're, you're just punching yourself in the head and if you're doing it wrong because you're losing potential people. And I'm not the only one that has that policy. When I actually ranted about that the other day, um, might have been yesterday or even this morning, um, I got a couple of people who sent me messages that said, I thought I was the only one that did that wouldn't accept friend requests from businesses using stuff inappropriately. So, and there was like five or six people. So that was pretty cool. I was like, Hey, I'm not the only crazy one. <laughs> and then, um, somebody says, um, uh, Steph says I'm her deputy. <laughs> Oh, that's the best. Steph is really sweet. I was having a bad day once, and I think I put out a snarky comment. And Steph, who I've never met in person, called me from Minnesota. I got and I like I look at the number and see it's Minnesota, and I totally think it's like Target calling me to tell me my prescriptions are ready or something. And it wasn't. It was Steph. It was really cool. Um, <laughs> you know, and it's funny because I really um, I worry a lot about. Uh, hurting people's feelings and being offensive, probably not as much as I should, but um, I put this stuff out and and I say what I think. Like, I'm really adamant about this using Facebook properly thing, clearly. And people are so kind. I have the most amazing readership. They're intelligent. I get the best questions. And not everybody's comfortable commenting on Facebook or commenting on the blog. We got a lot of lurkers. We got a lot of people who read think, and then send me the most brilliant, brilliant emails. So it's, and it's really nice to get that affirmation like, oh, it's not just me that is incredibly annoyed by lack of professionalism in dress codes. Um, or, it, it, you know, people are agreeing with that. And it's, Steph has been really um, about being my deputy, being a big fan so that when I <laughs> step on people's toes, I kind of back off. Yeah, and choice wa choice wants you to say Minnesota again. Minnesota. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I have friends there. I spend time in Minnesota. I like it. I know what a hot dish is. I, I know where Lake Wobegon is. Yeah. <laughs> There's not really a Lake Wobegon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then Angela Palmer, she um she asked um. Can you ask her what she feels about people randomly sending out, or just wait, um, like my page without having an established relationship? 
You know, I think for all my ranting about misuse of Facebook, we need to understand that not everybody knows how to use it properly. So a lot of times when you get that, um, it's a newbie. It's a newbie. So does it drive me crazy? Yes. But um, and there's also the, the, second, the second pet peeve um, is when people want me to be an end of their page, but their page is not a service that I would ever use. So if you're a massage therapist in California, I don't need to be a fan of your page. And unless we're true like friends, or unless you send me an email and you say, I really would like you to check out my fan page and tell me what you think, um, you, I don't need to be a fan of your page. It's just going to clutter up my news stream. Like, I got enough to look at. Um, I think it's wonderful if you're offering a special on couples massage around Valentine's Day. But I don't really care. <laughs> it's not. It, it is not changing or improving or adding value to my life to know that. And so um, I don't. And I regularly kick massage therapists off of my practice page. You know, I have a fan page for the Blue Streak stuff, but I have a fan page for my private massage practice. And every so often, and it's tough because it's under my name. Um, so I, I see that sometimes people get confused um, and they're not sure. You know which. Am I massage therapist practice or am I massage therapist yelling at other massage therapist and joking? So they get confused about which one they should be at. But I regularly go through the fans on my, my practice page and make sure that it, it truly is clients or people related or friends of my clients or local business owners. Um, and if I see, like, seriously, Ryan, if you were to fan my practice page, I would want to walk this week. I would, you can actually do that as an administrator. You can remove fans from your page yep. um, because there's no need for you to be on there. And I don't want my colleagues making colleague type thing references on my practice page. That's a mechanism for my clients and things that are appropriate for me to put up my clients are not appropriate for me to put out to my clients. So while I'm a big fan of mixing um, personality and clients and personality and colleagues, there's no reason for my colleagues and my clients to be interacting. And there's no reason for it, and oftentimes it's inappropriate. So um, as much as I'm about mixing the personal and the professional, there's certain ends of the professional spectrum that should be kept separate. And I'm going to have to write about that because it's very confusing. <laughs> and then massage, Sorry. Yeah, massage therapy world asks, um, ask her how she feels um, about friend requests from business networking acquaintances. I'm okay with that um, because Facebook has plenty of mechanisms to separate different groups of people. There's lists, and um, Eric Brown did a webinar, and he talked about effective use of lists. Um, and it's been written about, and it's all over the place. Um, there's really good ways to use lists. So not everybody, uh, like, I think that you can be Facebook friends with your family, with your friends, your true, genuine social friends, and also your colleagues and other professional um, networks, because you can use lists. There are exceptions. People who lead extreme lifestyles, um, people, and I say extreme lifestyles probably because I'm boring. Um, but you know, if you're out doing a lot of things that your clients shouldn't know about, if you're out um, doing a lot of drinking and debauchery, um, and you find that pictures of yourself come up a lot, one maybe you shouldn't be on Facebook. Um, but you know, certainly you want to use privacy mechanisms, or you know. Um, Kelly Wise of Massage Therapy World, which is just a brilliant resource, brilliant resource for massage therapists, um, massagetherapyworld.com, find it. Um, it's She chooses to not be friends with her clients because, you know, she's an ethics teacher, and she sees what can happen when you get a client who essentially stalks you. And maybe they'll see, uh, if they're your friend on Facebook, and they see that you really like a certain restaurant, there. Um, so there's a lot of really great reasons why you shouldn't be friends with your clients on Facebook. However, there's a lot of really great mechanisms to protect your privacy and to still use it effectively to communicate with your clients on your profile page as well as your business page. So I'm more of a fan of using privacy settings um, and lists than of just avoiding it altogether. But it's a personal decision you have to make. And you have to know the tools. Facebook is just a big toolbox of potential advertising and market, marketing connections. Um, use your tools wisely, just like anything else. You wouldn't slap an ad in the newspaper without really looking into it and having it proofread. You, you 
user tools properly. And what about people that um, spam your pages and stuff like that, even though you might know them and stuff? That is an excellent way to get knocked off my page and get a nasty <laughs> little message from me privately. <laughs> um, and you know, it doesn't. I found I have found it's not happening with me as much anymore. I get the occasional wacky spam. Um, on the fan pages, but you know you can block it and you can report it. Um, I've had a couple of incidences of that happening, but I think at this point, I mean, no, I send them. I erase. You can delete it right from your wall. I send the offender a message that said, "Hey, this is not okay. If you have a product or service you're interested, in, um, you think I'll be interested in, then tell me about it, and um, we'll chat. Maybe it's something I do want to learn about." Um, but it's not cool to just slap stuff on my wall and hope that because I have a couple hundred friends, people are going to read it. And it's totally ineffective because if someone slaps some spam up on my wall, the only people who are going to see it are people who proactively go to my page. Like, and that doesn't happen very much. Most of the interaction happens from your newsfeed. So it's also not really effective. And you're going to piss me off. <laughs> and Angela says, because they're scared of you. <laughs> Which is ridiculous, because I'm actually a really sweet person. <laughs> <laughs> and one thing I don't like um, is events. I mean, people are invent inviting you to events, even from across the world kind of thing. And That's tough, because it's a really great tool, but it's misused. Um, you know, I think the events is great, and tomorrow, my local Boy Scout troop is having a special thing at Pop Gino's. Um, the pizza place is kind of a chain out here. Really, really good pizza. Um, I like it. And I'm excited. And Facebook is reminding me, like, right on the right-hand side of my screen is the little events, and it says Boy Scouts Papagino thing, and I'm going to go and buy my dinner at Papagino's, and the Boy Scouts get, like, 20%. Yay! Like, what a great excuse to eat out for me. So, or to get some pizza, at least. And it's a great mechanism. When it's used properly, it's fabulous. But, yeah, I don't need to get invited to that class that is... A modality I'm not in any way interested in, and the class is in Nevada. Like, I'm probably not going to get there. You're annoying me. And I would much rather receive a private message from someone that says, hey, would you be interested in this class? Um, or create the event and then link to it so that all your friends can make a post. Hey, anybody interested in coming to Nevada for this class? That's a more effective way to do it without being intrusive. Don't make me opt out. I'm happy to opt in when I'm interested. Don't make me opt out. You're giving me work to do. M Massage Therapy that. World says events equal the, the evil. So. <laughs> yeah, they're pretty. They are. They are evil. And I hope that Massage Therapy World is Kelly because she's great and she's right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and have you run into a lot of therapists that are really competitive? You know, that's interesting um, because I think that's really the second big problem with us um, with, in, in our field. Um, for me, like the mixing of this warm care work that we do and yet having to be a business owner and make right, the right decisions so that we can make an income on this. Um, it's about collaboration versus competition. I'm going to assume that the bulk of people listening are super high quality collaborative therapists who are not worried about the therapist down the street stealing all their clients. If you are confident in your work and your business practices are decent and your marketing is halfway decent, you have nothing to worry about. Um, it's when therapists start businesses or um, they're in a highly stressful employee environment and they start to feel threatened. Um, in, in unconfidence and concerned about their skills that they think other therapists are going to steal work from them. I have an amazing network of massage therapists around. There's five of us. Um, and when I have a client, a regular client, who has some TMJD stuff, that's not work that I do really well. But Andrea on the street is amazing at it. She's phenomenal. She trained with the dentist. The oral stuff and she's really good so when I have a client and something like that pops up or when someone calls me a potential new client and that's their issue I don't treat it I send them to Andrea 95% of the time those clients have come back to me once that issue was resolved once she helped fix it 
and you can't be afraid of sending massage therapists or sending your clients out to other massage therapists. If we have a genuine caring about the client getting better, that's going to manifest into greater things. And that's a line from my friend Gregory Hurd. I'm going to say again because it's that important. If you genuinely care about your client getting better and you refer them out, that will manifest into greater things than the $70 that you lost sending them out to another. But of course, we always run into these highly competitive people. Usually, um, usually it's an office team issue. Just junior high and high school, it's always a self esteem issue, right? <laughs> um, you know, and if I have bumped into therapists in my area who would never refer a client out. They'll try and try to fix something, and if they can't or they can't help the client get better, they'll just keep trying and taking their money. And um, and that's tough. That's really tough. Don't be one of those people. Rise above it. But it's hard in our fields. It really is. It's so hard because um, we want to help people, but we also want to pay our rent and feed ourselves. But it's collaboration is the key. And I mean, is that gonna? Do you actually see a lot of therapists starting to go that route at all? That they're starting to collaborate with each other or try to, or is it where we are we so our distance as a profession? Would you say? You know, I think it's such an, that's such an individual experience thing. I know in my neighborhood and in my town and the network of therapists that we've created, the five or six of us, um, we're all like that. But I think that we hang out because we're all like that. And I, my guess is if you asked every massage therapist in the country, you'd get exactly a 50-50 split. I, the world is what you make it. You, you are the average of the people you hang out with. And um, so... You know, I was on the phone with a therapist a couple weeks ago um, who actually said I would never refer one of my clients out. I was like, or she said, actually she says, I wouldn't, she said I would never refer one of my clients out. But she also said, I would never share an office with another massage therapist. I said, why? I love sharing my office with another massage therapist. I have someone to play with. It's great. She said, well, that's like all my clients. I said, are you really that crappy of a therapist? Like, are you that bad at your job that just having someone else in proximity is going to be an issue for you? And um, she didn't really like that. She ended the phone call pretty quick. Um, so it's all about self-confidence. And I really hope that you're able to find, and I'm going to assume, again, that all these people listening are, um, you know, all five of you. Um, hi, Angela. Hi, Steph. No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Kelly, hey, um, I think that, um, you know, if you want to be a collaborative therapist, you just need to, to look around you and, you know, ask around. And I would bet if you approached five or six therapists, you'd at least find two that were super nice and wanted to play with you and be nice. And do you actually do um, newsletters at all? I'm sorry, do what? Newsletters. I do email newsletters for my clients. And they work really, really well. Um, it is probably my most effective tool, and I'm very lazy about it. In theory, I'd like to do one monthly. Um, I probably get around to it every eight to ten weeks. Um, when I'm slower, when I don't have a week with 20 clients, and I start to, I call it nail-bitingly slow, um, that's when it's usually... I get myself um, off my butt and I write a newsletter, and it never fails. I send a newsletter out, and I'll have five people who I haven't heard from in a couple of months call me that week to get in. So it is an incredibly effective mechanism. I have fun doing my now, my, now that I've started to be me with them. I make funny jokes. Like at Christmas time, um, I'm usually pretty good about from Thanksgiving through Christmas sending out like one every 14 days or so just to push some gift certificate sales um, and really just to connect with my clients because it's Christmas time. And um, I always put – Christmas pictures of like me and my family when I was really little, and they love it. They, uh, clients love it, and um, I'm actually going zip lining in Vermont next week. And I went to Vermont last year over the July Fourth weekend to play with my friend Chris Whitland, who's a massage therapist who I met through AMTA. My best friends are all massage therapists now. Anyhow, I'm going up there. We're going to do zip lining through the trees, um, through the mountains, and I absolutely will put a picture of that in my newsletter. My clients love it. So if you make your newsletter something personal, people are going to read it, and it's going to be an excellent mechanism for reminding people that you exist. Is so I, you know, email marketing is not dead. Email newsletters are, are king, I think. 
is it a really fine line with the personal stuff with the newsletter then? And well, you know, I don't think it's, I feel like it's common sense, but apparently common sense is not that common. <laughs> you know, put fun things about yourself. You know, and I, I've said this before, just because I, I put a picture of, um, uh, for Christmas this year, I gave all of my brother's kids, um, I found those really cool old wax lips that we used to be able to get when we were kids. I had all wax lips, and we had a great time with them, and the kids had these big, bright wax lips, uh, wax lips and I, I put um, I put a picture of that in one of my newsletters with, I think, my niece and I with these silly wax lips. That's appropriate. Um, my clients don't need to see a picture of me on a date. That would be inappropriate. Um, there's, yeah, there's always boundaries and lines, um, but I feel like they're, it's not that complex. You know, I can put that I was, did a little hiking in Vermont without saying, giving the address and telling who I was with in Vermont. And then, uh, uh, Phyllis asked, you know, you can be smart about it. Yeah. Phyllis asked, uh, what about the wind chimes? <laughs> I almost just spit water out. Yeah. You know, it's funny. It's because, um, you know, on that, there's such a great spectrum of people in this field, right? Like we have massage therapists who are doing really um, clinical work with uh, clinical evaluation and, and critical thinking and orthopedic work. And, and then we have people who are just mellow and doing energy work and, I call them wind chime huggers. Like I, that's what I call that end of the spectrum. I my very first massage therapist, the massage my very first massage, she rang chimes before she left the room, and um, that was how you knew the massage was over. And I remember her telling me this. So this is what's gonna happen. You're gonna get dressed in there, and we drape you, and um, and then when the massage is over, I'm gonna ring these chimes and leave the room. And I was like, really, chimes, really. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's not my thing. That's not my, it's, it's great. It's really lovely. She was the first massage therapist in my town and people still ask and say, Oh, I remember Teresa. She had those chimes. Her daughter is a massage therapist now. Um, but I, I think that you can be someone who does that level of intuitive and, and warm work. Um, and and still run an effective business and have a brain in you. You know, and I, I, I get very annoyed um, by people who think that um, because you're an energy worker or because you got some wind chimes and some prisms in your office, you can't run an effective business. I think that you can, that you are not mutually exclusive. <laughs> oh, and I forgot to mention earlier that um, Angela said that you have lettuce between your teeth. Yeah, she's funny. <laughs> I don't, I chat. <laughs> yeah, and then um, here, what else? Um, a Andrea asks, any, any mega, mega backlash from your comp controversial blog posts? Um, a little bit. Um, a little, you know, it hasn't been too bad. Like, I haven't been told that I'm not allowed to go to any particular events. Um, I haven't gotten any real hate mail. Um, I read a great thing. Um, another massage therapist wrote that said something to the effect of, don't be turned off by her judgmental style. She tends to come down Mount Sinai with the tablet of commandments. And, and then through uh, commenting and conversation, amend the plan or amend the rules, um, which I thought was a really nice way of saying <laughs> that I'm a smart ass who thinks I know everything right off the bat. Um, once I started relaxing and being myself, and I started saying things out loud that I used to just think in my head, I found out that a lot of people agree with me. And somebody's got to step up and put her foot in her mouth on a weekly basis. I'll do it. Um, I think these topics um, of professionalism and personality and uh, you name it, I think they're too important for everyone to be scared to talk about. And there's people who have been out there talking about this stuff for a long time, and it pleases me to get to be someone who does it now. But yeah, has it come back and bit me in the ass? Uh-huh, absolutely. I, I get unhappy emails from people who are very offended. Luckily, I don't get that many of them, but 
you're going to have that. If, if you don't like the way I write and you don't like the things I have to say, then don't read my blog. Like, that's okay. It's okay. There's stuff I don't read because I just don't like the way the message is stated. And if I'm wrong, call me out on it. I may end up agreeing with you. <laughs> so, yeah, I do get called out. I'm okay with that. <laughs> All right. Then Angela asks, um, can you ask her about the top two or top three tips for letting uh, your personality come out in marketing? In marketing. Well, I mean, we talked about one. I think the best and most effective way is through your communications with your clients, especially things like newsletters. Um, I think that Facebook is an excellent vehicle for that. I mean, it's also the biggest danger zone. Um, but, you know, on your fan page, a fan page is a great mechanism for being yourself. And my fan page has great silly stuff. Um, I think it's great, whatever. My clients enjoy it. All right, so I write what I'm snacking on a lot of times. If I'm eating during a blog post, I tell you about it. Um, most clients, when they come into the office, um, I'm eating something. I'm usually eating snacking at my desk between clients. So um, on my fan page, I'll make note of what's going on. My office mate brought me um, Dell's Lemonade. That's something we have in Rhode Island and Massachusetts. It's like a frozen slush lemonade. It's straight from heaven. It's delicious. And it's like very exciting when all the Dell's stands open up at the beginning of the summer. So my office mate brings me in Dell's on Wednesdays. Um, she comes in in the afternoon. She brings Dell's. It's awesome. So I put that on my fan page, and I tag my office mate in it, and I tag her, her business page in it. Um, and I say, you know, it's Wednesday. Christina's bringing in Dell's. This is awesome. And happy summertime, everybody. Um, you know, so Facebook and specifically your fan page are great mechanisms for letting out fun little things. We turn the music up really loud when we clean up at night. We'll put on some crazy hip-hop or Lady Gaga or something loud and fun. Because, you know, it's 8.30, we're exhausted, we have to clean up the office. Um, so we crank it up. So every so often, I'll put up a link to whatever music we're listening to. Like, this is what we're listening to when we clean up tonight. This is on this, the, the playlist tonight. Um, and I think even when you're out and doing a chair massage job at some kind of charity event, um, just being fun is important like we're people and if you're gonna say to somebody I want you to come into my office and so I can touch you for money you need a real person you need to be warm and happy and hopefully you're a warm and happy person I mean if you're like like I guess like I used to be like super super shy and scared to talk to anybody don't be yourself pretend you're super super like happy and warm and loving to everybody um it's just about I'm not gonna say you should drop the professional attitude but learn to be yourself within that. Be the best and most appropriate professional version of yourself. So those are my top tips. Newsletters, fan pages, and just, if you're silly, be a little bit silly. Um, avoid landmines. Avoid things um, like confidentiality breaches. Avoid um, any kind of innuendo or sexual conversations. Um, avoid things, of course, to very strict boundaries. Um, but find ways to be yourself. I can't really draw a great map because everyone's map is going to look a little different. Okay. <laughs> but that's what I do. I mean, that's, that, those are the, some of the little things that work for me. And then somebody asked before um, that you try to do email newsletters, but do you know that all your clients have email or are online and stuff? I do because it's part of my intake form. So, um, yeah, of my, I think I've got a list of a, just under 300 people um, and those are all people who I have met at an event and they have given me their email um, and people you know current clients who have um, put that email address on their intake form so that's how I know they're online so I know that when I send an email I think my regular email list right now is about 200 clients or so um, people who have seen me before or perhaps signed up at an event but haven't come into the office yet. Um, but mostly people who I've seen before in my office. Um, and you can, you know, all of these email services, um, they have, you can check the stats on them. So you can see if I send out 200 emails, I can see that 75 people opened them. Um, I can see the click-through rates, which means who clicked on the link to my website, who clicked on the link to buy gift certificates, who clicked on the funny Christmas picture. Um, and you can actually track these things. So you can see very easily 
um, if anybody's even opening your emails. And, and that's a really great tool. So yeah, if, if I have their email address, they're probably online. Okay. <laughs> if what? I don't, then, um, you know, and I do have a handful of people who I don't have email addresses for. And every so often, if I do a postcard mailing, like I haven't seen you in a while postcard, you know, they get an extra special little note because I know they don't keep up that way. But that's their choice, and that's okay. And that's not really, if someone's not available to communicate online, they're probably not my ideal client. And that's all right. There's somebody else's. And then Felicia Brown asks, um, um, do you survey your clients to learn how – this way, things are moving kind of fast. <laughs> um, do you survey the clients to learn how they want to have, how to stay in touch beyond email? I don't. I check in with people pretty regularly as they come and go. Like, I think when you have a core of regular customers, you kind of get an idea of that. Um, a newer thing that I'm doing now is um, I really need to um, update some of my client files. I haven't it's been a while since I've really asked people, hey, have you moved? Is this still the right address for you? Is this still the best email? Um, I never used to do confirmation calls before appointments. Um, and I started doing that really in the past six months. Since my schedule's gotten a little busier, um, no shows annoy me um, a little more. And they don't happen very much anyway, but last minute changes in no shows started to annoy me because something would happen, someone would have to cancel at the last minute, I wouldn't be able to fit them in again for a couple of weeks. Um, so that's frustration on both my part and the client's part. So I do confirmation calls now. So I check in with people. Like when they walk into my office or when I'm booking their next appointment, I say, what's the best way for me to confirm with you? Do you prefer a phone message like a voicemail or an email or a text? And the bulk of my clients prefer email or texting. Um, so I, that's the kind of information I get either on a screening phone call, like how, how is the best way for me to – uh, contact you to confirm your first appointment. Um, can I email you the forms for you to fill out ahead of time? So I think I I don't have a clear mechanism for that. I've never set up a formal mechanism. Sorry, Felicia. Help me set up a formal mechanism. <laughs> and thank you for staying up to watch this, Felicia. Yeah. <laughs> so I've done it in a very casual manner through my intake forms and verbal communication. And then what do you do about clients – that find out about your blog. Are you okay with them reading your content then? Well, yes. Um, I don't, I have a handful of clients who know me very well um, who know that I do this blue streak thing. Um, I do not direct them to my blog, um, but the reality is if somebody Googles my name, it's going to come up. Like my massage practice will come up and the blue streak stuff will come up. And yeah, I'm okay with it. I don't, you know, it's blogging. It's out there. There's no way I can prevent it. I I try very much to be sure that I'm writing for massage therapists. Um, and then every so often with a controversial post, I'll, I'll kind of look at it again and I'll say, if some of my more sensitive clients were to read this, would it, would it cost me their business? And there's been a couple of times where I've been concerned about that. But you know what? The reality is I, I don't write anything inappropriate in my blog. There's nothing – there's no sexually charged content. Um, I know of a massage therapist who also does sex counseling with couples, and she has a sex blog. And I think that is a huge conflict. That would concern me. The stuff I write – while I prefer to not mingle clients and colleagues, this is a real world that might happen, um, so I don't encourage that interaction, but – I also can't worry about it either. It's just a facet of who I am, and it's what it is. What is the future of Blue Streak? The future of Blue Streak? <laughs> I am, um, I think that uh, my call is going to be to put out some learning resources, um, marketing, online marketing, um, all sorts of marketing, um, for newer massage therapists. I think the bulk of the emails that I get are from newer massage therapists. And um, I think we're going to put out some ebooks and some learning videos. I think that's going to be really fun. And I think that's all going to happen in the next five or six months. So everybody should get on over to writingabluefreak.com site and sign up for the emails. There's now this really cool little email box on the upper right hand side of the site. And I can tell you that. My first ebook or video, I'm not sure exactly what's going to happen with that yet, is going to come out in the next month or so. And if you're on my email list, you don't have to pay for it. But if you're not on that email list, you're not going to get the coupon code 
and it's going to cost you a little cash. Okay. <laughs> Get on the email list. <laughs> so what's what is the uh, ebook e going to all cover then? Um. Yeah, I'm going to actually decide that over my July Fourth vacation when I write it. Okay. <laughs> I have two ideas, and I haven't decided which one I'm doing first. Yeah. Um, it'll be marketing-ish. I haven't decided exactly what area I'm going to focus on. Yeah. But it'll be quick. It'll be fun. There'll be a video component as well as some written material, and you're going to want it. Yeah. <laughs> and if you had to, had to do it all over again, what color would you choose? I really like the blue. <laughs> I tried, at first, I really thought that I would change the color, um, like every of months I would get really bored with it. I think when I was in high school I had a big hunk of pink hair, like that bright, bright manic panic pink. Because I was totally in high school like when it was grunge and we were all wearing flannel shirts and combat boots and um it was cool to have like crazy hunks of colored hair and I had a, a bright pink chunk of hair. My parents were just so patient with me. So patient. Um so I had the pink hair then but I think uh, I'm glad about the blue. I really really am <laughs> so are you gonna get into video more too? Might get into what? Get into video. I'm, I remember you talking a while yeah, ago about really vlogging am. and stuff. And I think yeah. This was like the big hurdle to get me over that. Yeah. Because I've recorded about 15, and in every single one of them, I'm like, I don't like the way my hair looks, and my nose looks funny, and it's light, and I can't have that painting in back of me funny. And I'm stumbling over words, and I uh, just have to kind of remember myself that finish is, uh, finish is better than perfect. And um, yeah, there's going to be a lot of video, and especially. Um, I know, Ryan, you're a part of it, um, and a couple of people listening are Felicia, and I'm not sure who else. Um, we're all part of the Massage Learning Network, which, let's see if I remember, it is poised to become the most comprehensive and user-friendly massage learning resource in the world. So I know we're all submitting videos and screencasts of how to do certain things online and technique videos, and that's launching in the fall, and you can check that out at massagelearning.com and register for the updates about that. Um, so I'm going to have to get over my little video fear. It's coming. <laughs> you promised? Yes, and you helped me with that tonight, Ryan. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> you did 100 times better than I thought you would. No, just joking, oh joking, God. joking. <laughs> I'm not even going to say what I was going to say because it was inappropriate. No. <laughs> ethics, so ethics, yeah. <laughs> Are there any nice people questions there, or just you making mean comments? No. <laughs> Heart deep. Yeah. <laughs> so um, the best way to get get a hold of you is just writing uh, bluestreak.com, then, right? Yeah, it's really easy to find me. If you Google Blue Streak Massage, um, you're going to find the website. It's so much easier to Google things than it is to actually look um, for websites, but yes, it's writingabluestreak.com. Um, I'm Alyssa at writingabluestreak.com, and no one is ever going to spell my name right, A-L-L-I-S-S-A, -S -S and you're never going to remember that, and that's okay. If you Google Blue Streak Massage, I pop right up, and I'm very easy to find. And then Felicia asked a question quick. Um, what are Alyssa's um, videos on? I um, have submitted um, one video so far to the Massage Learning Network. i got a couple other um, in the hopper I need to edit. Um, I have done one on using Facebook lists, and then the second one I have coming up is going to be about, um, or I've got one about creating Facebook lists, and the second one is about how to use them to direct the information that's coming to you and also the information you're putting out. We touched on that a little bit tonight. I got a couple other screencasts on um that I haven't made yet, but I'm prepared to, about how to use different email services. Um, I know we've got so many different ones that we use. There's MailChimp and Constant Contact and Vertical Response and AWeber. Um, so I'm hoping to do a couple screencasts about the basics of getting started with MailChimp, because it can be a little scary um, at first. So I think that's going to be my thing. And draping. We need a good video about draping. And um, so I'm working with my friend Greg Hurd on that one. Okay. <laughs> And what do you see yourself in five years? <laughs> uh, oh, on a beach, and um, I'd like to give massage in a little hut on a beach, like a couple massages a week and do some writing. Uh, I have no idea. I, 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 two years ago, I didn't think I would be doing this at 11 o'clock on a Wednesday night chatting with the massage nerd. Two years ago, I didn't know there was a massage nerd. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> 
sorry. You know, the, I, I have no idea, and I think that is probably the most fun thing ever. Um, I, I didn't think that Felicia Brown would ever listen to my thing on the massage nerd show. <laughs> Like, I didn't think I would ever be having dinner with Laura Allen or I'd be friends with Ruth Warner or that I would get to email and, and communicate and talk to massage therapists all over the country. Oh, there's this really cool woman from Texas who emailed me the other day. She's got like nine kids. She homeschools her nine kids and her and her husband run their own massage practice. And anyone who says you can't make a living doing this is full of crap because her and her husband make their living and support their family of 11 on their massage practice. Like, how cool is that that I get to, to email back and forth with someone so cool? Like, I really totally want to go to Texas now and see how these people do it because they're amazing. And she knew more about networking groups than I will ever know. It's, she's brilliant. And, um, and that's, uh, who knows? Who knows? Five years from now, I hope to know a ton more people just her and maybe give some modicum of useful advice. And where can people see you in person the next time? Where will people see me in person? Yeah. Um, I think um, anyone who wants to come to Massachusetts, <laughs> come, down, <laughs> come to the summer with Peaches and Dell's Lemonade. Um, I will be, I think the next thing I'll be at will be Portland in October, the ANTA National Convention. I can't get to, um, I can't get to for this weekend, I can't get to the World Massage Festival, which my friend Lisa said we're going to call Massage Stock. Um, <laughs> so I can't. I think that's just awesome. Um, I can't get. Uh, I forget where it is. Somewhere down south. Um, I can't get there over the summer. So I'll see everybody in Portland in October, okay. and I'll be there for like nine days. So we're all hanging out. Okay. Great. <laughs> Yeah, this interview has definitely not been boring. So. Thank you. I think that's really good. Yeah. And people actually got to see your blue hair, so it was very nice. It did. It was better. I only have like three lights in this little apartment, so that's all I got. Yeah. So when I interview you, because um, I don't like this whole thing where people can see me but not you. So when I interview you, we'll do like a close-up of my hair for me, and then I want pictures of your Crocs for you. <laughs> Deal. I'm going to make fun of them the whole time. You should definitely wear socks with them. <laughs> or sandals with socks. Is that bad? Yeah, that's fine. Whatever. Dude, you're from Minnesota. You can totally pull it off. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so thank you very I much. Fast, huh? yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we definitely have to have you on again. Cause <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, <laughs> we'll set something we, up. You know what I want to do? We've got to figure out a way to do um, like multiple people. I think that Michael Reynolds and I should do a show together. Yes, definitely. I think that would be super fun. So we're going to have to find where some of us are in the same place at the same time and do something now. Yep, definitely. <laughs> Instead of playing like 30,000 feet up right now, not listening. Yep. Um, but, uh, but we'll, we need to do that. But thank you. This was like the hugest thing ever. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, thank you. And thank you, everybody that's tuned in. And sorry, it's kind of hard to read the chat because everything was going so fast. <laughs> Hey, yep. That's so awesome. Yep. <laughs> Somebody get me a transcript of that. I'm going to need to see it. Yep. <laughs> Copy and paste people. Yep. <laughs> okay, thanks. Thanks, Alyssa. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night, everybody.